ladies and gentlemen, to uh, episode nine of Breed to Succeed. Uh, today, I'm joined by Dr. Sarah Gray. Hello, Sarah. Hi. <laughs> we are all ready to go. Um, we're over in sunny Ballarat. Uh, we escaped the cold, if anyone's wondering. We were going to set up outside in the barn and uh, show you this beautiful establishment, but uh, it's very cold here, isn't it? It's absolutely freezing. <laughs> It's a uh, character building living in Ballarat. Yeah. That's all I'll say for some of these, uh, yeah. some of the participants, and that they've had a had a lot of rain. Um, today, Sarah, we're going to be discussing the importance of falling down. The most one, let's put down is the most. I, I'm not sure where it fits in the criteria. It'd be interesting your thoughts on that uh, going yeah. forward. But it's an essential part of the whole process, isn't it? Absolutely, it's a pretty uh, pretty important, and um, can't avoid it. Do you want to get one of those cute little critters on the ground so um and as we um, all know uh, when it goes wrong it can go very wrong so we want it to go as well as possible <laughs> i'll be interested in in a lot of uh what you've got to to say because uh what we've been setting up and we've been having a few little <laughs> issues both of us going backwards and forwards um you've had falling alarms going off yeah <laughs> we have <laughs> i think i've run out the door twice so no we're okay at the moment but uh we've got about eight in at the moment with alarms on so absolutely yeah. we want, want people to get involved today's episode is actually brought to you by asba um australian standard Bread breeders association i've left the harassed the trotters logo down the bottom as well because we are situated here um is it Yabby Dam Farms or Harasta Trotter? Which do we like? Uh, ooh, it's Yabby Dam's farm, but the breeding side is Harasta Trotters. So, yeah, you know, we're in the breeding barn, so it can be Harasta Trotters. <laughs> and you're you're the, the head vet. You're the actual only vet here, but you're the you're, the, you're a full time vet. Full time vet here, and set my own clinic up here as well. So have my own. So I do a lot of client work as well and everything. So we've got client mares here to fall down to. So so in the same light as um as as Calf with Northern Rivers post this, like ask as many questions, please get people to ask as many questions as they can, but post this if they want questions asked, you are a, a proper working veterinary person, yeah, so, no, so I'm by actually, all means come and see you and, and, and talk to you and, and approach you, that's hard Totally, to totally, yeah. totally, but actually interestingly I'm a, I'm a surgeon by training, so <laughs> not, so just uh, have a passion for repro as well, so um, yeah. And not long uh, fold one down yourself either, that, that's about right. So yeah, uh, yes, yes, mother. not long fold down myself. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll <laughs> Made it through the falling season last year with three days to go. So. <laughs> This year, be, this year you'll be a walk in the park. Oh, I know, I know. It'll be, it'll be so much easier, it won't be funny. We've already got quite a few people in Louise Pangazio. She won't believe that I actually did say that. We <laughs> must get through um, a couple of little uh, tidbits. One, if you're watching this on Harness Breeders' uh, Facebook page, make sure you get on there, like it, and follow it. So is it um, over the years, Desiree can keep, uh, not over the years, but through the year, there'll be more prizes going up. There'll be a lot more other stuff going up um, for the show. We want to be able to keep in touch with you. We're nearly at the end of the show, but we're not not a series, but we're not quite. And I've got a little bit of news to go uh, there as well. So we want people to follow on the Facebook page, uh, Victorian Breeders, and Desiree will share that link in, I'm sure, um, going forward. If you want to uh, do anything else with the Harness Breeders, I can't believe, oh, that's okay, I can do that because you don't know what I've done. No one knows what I've done. I just did a mistake and no one can see it, so I'm not <laughs> actually happy about that. We have got the Vic Breeders uh, website above your head there. Um, <laughs> For people to see so it's vicharnessbreeders.org.au go there and you can become a member you can follow all these you can see all the um, previous episodes that go backwards and forwards as well so i encourage people to visit vicharnessbreeders.org.au and you'll be able to um, become a a lot more learned i suppose um, on a lot of a lot of these things i'm just trying to make sure i don't uh, I've actually lost one of my slides. I'm in so much trouble. I thought I had everything sorted out. <laughs> and I haven't got any of it here at all. So the, um, I better not put that there either. I'll be in trouble for that one. So um, where is that? Um, I can't find it. I didn't, oh, there it is. There it is here. <laughs> Don't stress. It's actually here. So if you want to become a member of Harness Breeders Victoria, and you're not on screen now, sir, so that's all good for you. <laughs> if you want to become a member of um, Harness Breeders Victoria, it's just $55. It starts from the 1st of September 2020 right through to the 31st of August next year. There is incentive to become a member um, early on. I'm just trying to do too many things at once. It does my head but we're right now. So if you join um, and renew before the September 1, 
uh, with complements of as breeders and also uh, Victorian harness breeders, you go into the draw to win a service fee to either the storm inside, uh, they're at two and a half thousand dollars up donated by Alibar, or great success, which has been di diagnosed, di diagnosed, donated, donated by you know leader. Uh, bloodstock, so and I think there is actually a couple of other opportunities there for King, King Van Avenger service fees as well uh, for people to, to get involved. So become a member, $55, just go to the vicharnessbreeders.org.au forward slash membership um, and you can sign up there or rejoin and you're going to, to uh, draw to uh, win one of those. And you also then get other op rights as a member, um, this show going forward, you can have input into the, this show. There's so many other things that we can actually do by becoming a member. You get a, a voice. You're also uh, eligible for awards um, on the night, and you get to actively lobby. There's a lot going on in the breeding sea scene at the minute, and um, people should be uh, be able to um, get involved with it and, and go from there. Just so says as we're back on screen. Don't worry, have your drink. You're fine. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> I can't, I can't do that. The um, the stadium guide is on online is available online, and I could have done that to see it would have made life a lot easier for mm -hmm. it. Right now, I'll, I'll put that in front of you, so you've got nothing to worry about. Mm -hmm. You can get online with that, or there's a hard copy that will be sent out to you if you become a, a member of the um, Harness Breeders as well going forward. So we must say thank you very much to Oz Breeders, um, and you can visit their website, Australian Breeders. Australian Standard Bread Breeders Association. Uh, they have a Facebook site, so you, we can get involved um, with all that. Another uh, little one we have to get through, we have to look after our sponsors, and we must say a huge thank you to Mr. Andrew Soper um, and Barristock. They get behind our weekly winners. So you go into the draw, anyone with the best comments, get involved, and you go into the draw to win uh, 10 bags of um, their uh, what is it? Stud breed balance. I'll be in trouble for that. on it at the end of end of today's show but we have actually got um, another show going to happen so I might actually go to it right now we've got, still got two more episodes so we actually alluded that we only had um, uh, the one more episode we've actually got sorry about that I don't think anyone could hear me just then because there was no audio so i apologize for that now i've got it sarah's going to kill me right so we've got the audio back so that's okay so uh calf mcintosh um sorting out the semen for 2020 so there's a bit of a juggle at the minute with frozen semen. well not yeah. frozen semen as much uh, chilled. chilled semen is going to be a bit of an issue so yeah. next week we will be devoting a lot of time to that possibly also frozen semen if we don't get onto it today with sarah we might get onto it today with Sarah and also with Kath next week with the pros and cons for that and also um, getting your mares on site um, and, and where you're situated with each state. So Kath will cover off um, on that. And then we've got a, a bonus one the, um, the week after. We're actually going to have uh, week 11 now, which wasn't planned. Um, and we will be with uh, President Nick Hooper um, and just on some pretty exciting news. I don't know all of it. I just know bits and pieces of it as to what, uh, what's going to happen in the breeding landscape uh, from 2020 uh, as far as bonuses and the likes with Vic Bread um, and all the rest. It's pretty exciting times. I had a touch of a conversation with Nick um, about how long he expected this one to go, says, mm -hmm. and he alluded that it may go for two hours. He thought it might go for <laughs> two hours, maybe two and a half. Depends if Carlton or Richmond are playing football as to how long it actually may go. But uh, yeah, he's uh, he's very passionate. He's very excited about this, and there is a reason we won't be uh, announcing any of that stuff going forward. It will be hopefully announced um, in a couple of days prior. But please log on and fire your questions, I'm sure plenty of people are going to have heaps of questions to ask um, in relation to that. Sarah, I've come over here for you for uh, the importance of filing down and, yes. and, and all the, um, 
the, the tasks, I suppose, of going about it, and I'll, I'll hand over to you. The only thing you've got to do is tell me when you want me to throw your slideshow up, so that I know because uh, yeah, I better. Yeah, you can you can pop up that there. up now. Yeah, yeah, we're ready to go. Very good. <clears throat> You let me know when you're, you're up. Fine. Oh, you're up? Okay, yeah, cool. I just, awesome. I've got to get rid of a couple of things as you go, but they'll be right. I can get them done yeah, in two seconds. Cool. Yeah, so thank you very much. Um, so I've just got put together a bit of a presentation um, discussing falling down. And um, obviously, as we kind of talked about before, it's one of the um, probably more stressful, I think, would be um, the best way to summarize the falling down part, um, the getting and fall part. Um, and then the growing of the little bubba, but um, getting from this ultrasound blob through to this cute little tinker here is um, it can actually be fairly, fairly stressful. So I thought I'd just go through some of the things that certainly we do here and, um, and I do and discuss a little bit about the actual falling down procedure. My wife gets very stressed. My wife pops a fair hiding in uh, in these podcasts. She gets extremely stressed. My, me and my daughter try to avoid her as often oh, okay. as we can. <laughs> it is a, it's a very stressful time. It's a very stressful time. Um, so I think one of the, the biggest things that I, I mean I try to do is just be as prepared as possible. And um, unfortunately, falling is one of those things that you can be entirely prepared and have absolutely everything ready and it can still go very wrong but if you are as prepared as you possibly can be it minimizes those kind of wrong things when they do happen so part of being prepared i think one of the most important things is just knowing your estimated falling dates so um we generally even with if you're falling one mare if you're falling a hundred mares you know it's important just to know these estimated falling dates um, we generally have the accepted range as being about 340 days from your last ovulation day or last date of service, whichever you know. Um, and we can, and then everything as far as pre preparing for your falling system um, season can kind of work backwards from that estimated falling day. Um, again, though, it is important to realize that in a mare, it has a fairly large range. So anywhere between, you know, 20 days on either side of that 340. So I think being prepared and starting to get prepared, it should start quite early. So, you know, when you know your earliest mare or when your mare is the first mare is due, kind of start working back a good month, trying to be um, on board about a month or so beforehand. Are they consistent? Um, yeah, in interestingly so. So, um, you know, we are obviously I've only been here for so I think this is my third season now falling down. So starting to get to know the mares and it's not uncommon for mares that go early one year, will go early the next year or go right on time one year, go the next year. And um, there's definitely lots of little rules of thumb. But um, I think the weather plays a massive role in it to be honest you know we've had a fairly mild winter apart from the last two days <laughs> and I've had mares going early um, the last four have all gone early up to 10 10 15 days even like which is very abnormal for this early in the season so um so yes there's rain um, rules of thumb but be prepared nonetheless like early just don't don't count on those <laughs> um I think I put here falling groups and um, I think it's really important one of the things if you're falling down multiple mares is that you try and get your mares into their groups of approximately similar falling dates pretty early on that way you're not moving mares in and out of paddocks close to their falling dates which when you're changing them up and they've got to meet new mares and new hierarchy it can be quite stressful so getting them into their small groups um, early or you so for us I actually get them into their foaling groups when we wean them. So when we wean the foals, they all go into their foaling groups, the mares for the next season, and they go into groups of about six to eight. And then throughout the whole winter, they move in those groups, they stay, but they stay in those eight. And then coming up close to the foaling time, so keeping that 320 you know, to 360 range in mind, a month out, they come up close in groups of three to four. So in our, in our you can kind of see I'm walking down here with a foal, but these paddocks down here are the kind of group paddocks where they're in groups of three to four and then getting closer. So, you know, 10 days, two weeks out from falling dates, they come into their falling paddocks with their individual falling paddocks. And we'll kind of talk a little bit in a couple slides about having your different falling safe place options. But that's what we do here is we bring them into the individual paddocks. But I think in, in light of minimizing as much stress for your mare as possible, um, trying not to change up their groups too too late and close to their falling dates is really important. So be prepared, 
get them in their groups so they can just settle. Um, and that kind of goes on to the next slide with minimizing movement and stress. Um, and then I've put in there to factor in travel. So if you're an owner listening to this and you're traveling your mare to be fall down somewhere, um, discuss it with your vet or falling down farm, wherever you're going, what their recommendations are. And I, again, the whole idea is to minimize as much stress for that mare. So if they're having to go to a farm to fall down and they're going into a paddock with other mares, pre-falling, you might want to get up there early so they can kind of settle in and, and figure out their hierarchy. If you're coming, if they're going somewhere to fall down and the mare is going to be in her own paddock, her own place, you might not have to go as early. So client mares that come here, they've got their own paddock, their own box. So it's pretty, it, we're not getting as stressful, but we still like to not travel super close because that's stressful again. So it's all about minimizing stress for your mare and just, and just getting everything ready for her. Just very quickly, do you have a preference as to um, like falling down in groups or in paddocks on their own? Do you, do always you... on their own. I always fall on their own. No, yeah. sorry, if oh. mares came on, would you put a mare in with groups of horses or you'd rather no, in paddocks? No, so of... all the yeah. client mares that come in, they go on their own. Yep. yep, they have their own space. And like they've got other mares next to them, but yep. they're in their own, yep. own paddocks. Yeah, we don't mix them up. No. Um, and then just, again, getting closer, we're working back from that 340 estimated falling um, date again as we're getting kind of close so kind of you know 10 days two weeks out you want to always check for a caslux again um, even though I most of my mares that I fall I put in fall so I technically should know if I put a caslux in but it's always a good idea to check again um, because if they do have a caslux it's a good time to take them out um, at this point and you can worm your mare and, and vaccinate as well just leading up to falling so it's actually pretty important isn't it to very know. important to take out yeah, yeah. and um, with plenty of time as well is always good um, so going on to figuring out your falling place so um, again if you're if you're falling one or two at home and um, it's mares like to have a nice kind of safe quiet place on their own to fall. Um, most mares will fall, unfortunately, between 11 p.m. and 4 a.m. Um, because it's nice and dark, they're flight animals because they like things to be quiet and in and, and, and their little safe place. So I think um, whether you choose to fall in paddocks or boxes is completely up to you or whatever you have available. But a couple little pointers, um, if you're falling in a paddock, just make sure you've got an area whereby she's away from her so fenced off from her other other mares or other paddock mates um it is a it is nice to fall in paddocks because it's quite natural for the mares they often quite like it um you often have lots of room so there's plenty of you're not squished up against the wall or anything like that trying to you know help a mare out if they need help and you do want good even footing so obviously a paddock that's relatively flat not on a hill that the little tinker's then going to roll down and um, you can see here, we put some straw on the paddocks often, um, just because they do like to have a nice straw bed. It's just, they like to kind of settle in and, and, and be nice and comfy. Um, the disadvantages of having a paddock based falling system is that if you are in Ballarat, for the last two days where it has basically nearly snowed oh, it's a you were going. <laughs> um, and we've had like 60 mils of rain um, so even though we've got beautiful falling paddocks with floodlights and everything all my mares are in so um, so having this other option if you're in Ballarat so these are my falling outside boxes and then I've got inside falling boxes as well um, if you're gonna do those obviously having nice um, plenty of room is always good and nice clean dry area um, and then I think straw bedding is preferred over shavings because it doesn't get all stuck to everything and um, in saying that if anyone's ever been here or here you'll see that all the mares are actually on shavings until they fall or m most of them are um, if they look pretty imminent that night then I'll often bed them on straw that night but um, I'll often keep them on the shavings because it's a bit easier from a mare point of view and then once they fall we we or are falling we'll bed them on straw at that point so so when you say it's easier on the mare um, from that point of view on shavings it, it's easier, easier just... for the guys to, to clean it out and whatnot and, yeah and yeah it's just they, they keep it a bit cleaner and tidier um but um as i said if a mare is in and she's fairly waxed up or has been for a couple of nights then we'll bed them on straw that night just to make things easier at two in the morning <laughs> this, this is a social media uh, show and i don't yeah. know if anyone watched yesterday gay waterhouse uh 
plonking herself down in a, in a box of straw. She says it's, it's the greatest luxury ever. It so. is. I've actually got photos of me lying in the straw with the foals having a little nap. It's lovely. And it's very warm. And we've got, you know, the uh, this new peat straw and it's beautiful. It's really it's yeah. really nice. The mares like it. So. It's funny how things go around and around in circles, yeah. isn't it? And you get yeah. back to straw. So, yeah. yeah. No, no, no. They, and the foals love it. It keeps them a bit warmer and everything as well, I think, anyway. Yeah. So... Um, so the next thing um, I'm just going to chat about is falling alarms. Um, obviously not an essential if you um, don't have them, don't freak out, but I personally think that they make life a lot easier. Um, I certainly spent my years as a vet school student walking around paddocks all night, but checking mares, but I'm too old and decrepit to do that now, so we are falling alarms. So. <laughs> um, there's a couple systems out there available. I think the ones that people will be most familiar with here in Australia would be the Fall Guard or the Smart Fall or the Magic Breeds, which are the halter based systems. So they go onto the mare's halter and then when the mare lies down and it, I think it dislodges a magnet, it will alert the system and the dialer, which will, if you have it next to your bed, it goes off. It's extremely loud or you can have it hooked up so it rings your phone. Um, so they're great. Um, the advantages of those, obviously, is that they're really easy to use. There's, you know, there's minimal fuss as far as putting them on. They're pretty straightforward. And the disadvantages, and this is just my totally my personal experience, is the false alarms. Um, obviously, I mean, I used these the first year I was here, and um, oh, it, I mean, they'll go off every time a mare lies down, which can be an absolute nightmare if you've got a lot of alarms on or you've just got an uncomfortable big fat mare like <laughs> they tend to lie down a lot so and we've got one at the minute who's due to fold next week and she likes to put the head on top of the post and uh oh. then moves the head stall just slightly so yep. then that, that it so she's not even it. laying down oh it's, i know it's, you, go, yeah. you go outside and there's nothing happening yeah. you're like, what's going on <laughs> yeah so. you can um definitely get pretty exhausted pretty quickly but um nonetheless they are great to use and, and um, they certainly do their job and we'll actually talk about one of the other advantages in a couple of slides with these alarms versus the other ones but the other one that we've actually moved to is the Siglu Volvo transmitters so these are a little transmitter here's one of these here and um, so it consists of this transmitter and then this little bit here is the um, magnet and so the magnet's actually in it right now and so what you do is you suture the transmitter into one side of the vulva and the magnet little loop here. So this loop is sutured into the other side of the vulva. So what happens is when it is activated, which is when the foal is coming out, here's a picture here. So you can see the magnet. I don't know if you can. Hopefully you can see it. You might have to magnify it. But um, the magnet is pulled out of the transmitter because obviously the foal's on its way. Or in this case, it's 99% out. Um, Don't rush because I just got that over a little bit bigger so people can actually oh, see, people yeah. actually see it. So yeah, yeah, right on. So, um, so yeah, so you can see. And so, after, by the pulling of the magnet out, what that does is actually activate the little box here, which is sitting under my desk in my office, and it's actually telling me that number five is activated. So I can then run into the office, see that it's number five, look on the board, see who's wearing number five, and then just go straight out to that mirror. So. The advantages of this one is that it is very specific to falling, so it means that I get a lot more sleep. So you generally don't have the the multiple multiple false alarms, um, and and so because they are so specific to the actual fall on its way. Um, however, under disadvantages, I have put false alarms because we found that last year we had a couple of mares that will they'll rub on them. So they'll rub the transmitter on the on the on the bloody um, shelters in the paddock, or if they're in a box, they'll rub it on the wall in the box, and they'll just dislodge the magnet a bit, and so you end up here and no one's falling. But so you do get a couple of false alarms. I'm not going to say they're they're fail proof, um, but um, they have certainly allowed me to 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 fall down. I think 49 last year with just the two of us, and we're falling down. I think 63 this year, just the two of us. So. And so they do definitely allow you to get a lot more sleep. Um, I guess the other disadvantage is that they're a little bit more cumbersome to place. Obviously the really nice um, halter ones you just strap into the halter, but these ones you have to actually suture into place. So it's a little bit more cumbersome. You have to bring the mare into the, bo into the crush, put a little bit of local in and suture it into place. So it's a little bit more time. And then I've put imminent foaling here because <clears throat> this was actually something that was brought up at another repro conference I was at a little while ago. And um, 
this isn't something that I personally find as a dis disadvantage, but another specialist found it. And base, and we'll you'll see later on in the next couple of slides. But because it is activated by the foal on its way, so the ex the separation of the vulva, your foaling is imminent. Like it, it is happening. So <laughs> you need to be able to get there pretty quickly if you just in case there is things that need to be corrected or anything like that. So some vets have kind of said that you know it's a it's a disadvantage because you don't have a lot of time to get there and, and help the mare out if she needs help. But I personally, I mean, I haven't found that to be a problem. I can get here pretty quickly, and um, but it, I just thought I'd better put it in anyway, because it's, it yeah, I is suppose, I suppose if they're not on site and they're a little way away, that-, that Yeah, yeah. Sense. It has meant that if um, my nurse is here on foaling duty, like she, she does have to stay here. Yep. Like she can't be at home because, yeah. She doesn't have time to get out. No, it, the, the foal is on its way. Yep. <laughs> it's well and truly on its way. So, um, but all in all, I have found them great. So, so the other thing that you can start to, to get ready is just having a basic foaling kit. And this will vary depending on what your uh, statuses or experience or how, how many, yeah, your skill set or what you're comfortable doing. But I think having a really basic setup is really good. So having some lube, some gloves, some towels, um, some form of tail wrap you can use, you can use vet wrap, glad wrap, um, a tail wrap and having a light source. So a torch, a head torch, whatever you've got. And what do you call them? Flashlight torch here. Flashlight. Flashlight. Sorry. And and then um, scissors or a blade and, uh, and then more towels, more towels, more towels. Um, if you are a little bit more advanced or, or your, your skill set's a little bit higher, you might have your folding chains and handles, some mare pain relief and, and maybe a colostrum refractometer as well or something that you can kind of check your refractometer. So this is kind of what sits outside um, my boxes. I've got my, my gloves, both just regular gloves, rectal sleeves, vet wrap and and elastoplast some lube hand towels a funnel a tube um falling chains falling ropes handles and my head torch my flashlight as i said lots of towels my emergency drug box and then this is um our fall resource bag so we've got oxygen tanks an ambu bag and endo and endotracheal tubes as well so um, we've got it all on site if needed, but obviously whatever your, your skill set is, you can just have a really basic setup. Um, and if you're a little bit more advanced, you can kind of build your box up a little bit more. And I'll, I'll, without sounding silly, if you understand a lot of the words that you were saying in the lead up to that, you would want more, more of those products. If, if a lot of that is going over your head, you possibly just want the basics. Yep. Definitely, you want a yep. torch, you want a towel. Some, some, uh, some light that yep. you, some, because as I said, they often fall between 11 and two or 11 and four. So you want some light, some towels and, and you know, something to just clean up the mare's tail really. I think you also um, want replacement batteries because I can guarantee yeah, you the torch goes the, flat yeah. halfway through no matter what yeah, you do. So. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and then I think having a, a blade and some scissors is, is pretty important as well. And we'll talk about that in a couple slides as to why, but, um, and yeah, obviously your towels to, to dry the little foal or, um, if you, if you need, so. Very good. So the next thing, so now that you're kind of all prepared, um, you've got everything, you've got your, your place where you're going to fold them, you've got your little kit sorted, plus or minus your alarms, and you now it's monitoring. You've just got to sit and wait and, and really be monitoring your, your mares and, and the signs that we've got to look for. We've got, you know, these are your main lists that are pretty well accepted as the signs that we, that we start looking at. So utter development and I, I've put here teat position as well and I'll explain why but generally we start to see the filling of the udders um, I've put care with maidens and and that being that I don't, hopefully these pictures come up pretty well but these two mares here both have exactly the same due date and and the one on the left here is actually a maiden mare and the one on the right's had a couple of falls so you can see the maiden mare on the left is is you, to the general person that might not seem much of an udder at all, but the next line says monitor for change. And the reason this is up here is because that udder actually changed quite from a d over a day. So that to me, you know, really says that 
that mare might be coming along, even though she doesn't have a huge udder, she's a maiden, yep. and, and, and it's changed, you know, it, it, it is starting to fill, and, and you might find with maidens, they don't necessarily have a huge nut udder, so be, so be careful with just looking for a big, big milk-filled udder, it's not necessarily the case, and again, you might not be able to appreciate it too well, sorry, it's a bit dark, but teat position, and this is one thing that I, I tend to personally look at on my maiden mares quite a lot, is that you'll find that those teats will start to, from this downward position here, where they really face down or even in a little bit, yep. they'll start to face out. So they'll actually start to point outwards a little bit. And I find maidens will do this a little bit more than even waxing up or, or, or dripping some milk. Just they start to point out with their teats and that's an indication that they're getting pretty close. And obviously that's just a, a physiological thing so that little foal can actually get to the access Nate, to the Nate teeth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. So they start to kind of point outwards a little bit. So biggest thing is monitor, monitor for change more than anything. So well, um, I love this series. I've learned something every time. I just <laughs> learned that was a big eye opener for me, that yeah. one. So yeah. Um, abdominal drop. Uh, so this can happen anywhere one to two weeks prior to falling. It's it's basically the foal starting to reposition and get ready for its exit. Um, and you'll see that the, the mare's stomach will drop down and, and usually back a little bit. Again, personally, I find this is, this tends to be an older mare thing more so and maidens, they can, they can look tucked up <laughs> and yep. fall the next day. So care with maidens as I've put again, but, um, certainly you will see some mares will really drop in the belly. I guess similar to humans apparently. So. Is it, um, you say they're about care with maidens. So if you've got a mare that's had say 10, 12 foals, are they in that position possibly a little bit earlier because of everything's constantly moved that way? So it's not necessarily- Totally, absolutely. Like yep. you can look at some of the old mares out here that have had multiple foals and they're just, they're hanging low compared yep. to some of the younger mares that are potentially even due before them. And they're still quite, you know, sitting nice and up. And again, it's just going to be having multiple mares, everything being a little bit more relaxed and all the rest of it as well. So, but you will sometimes see, you will, if you're looking at them on a daily basis, you will sometimes really see them drop um, and sink backwards a bit too. So perineal relaxation. So that's basically just the softening, um, like I'm pointing out here. So we kind of go along and prod all the tail heads of all our mares that are up in their falling paddocks um, and have a good little feel and you will feel it'll just get really spongy and soft. Um, and usually a week out from falling as early as that, sometimes a lot closer, but yep. So at the end of the day, we'll go along and we'll, we'll catch all the mares and we'll prod their, prod their bums. Is that a scary thing to do? Or is it something you should take a little bit of care with? Or with Potentially, it? yeah. If you don't know your mares as well, like um, um, we'll always have someone holding onto the head and then I kind of stand off to the side. Um, if you're, if you know your mare as well, proper way, but generally, yes, yeah. be, be careful, especially if you don't know your mare. Some of them can be a little sensitive. You're not on camera, so people didn't get to see what you just okay. did, but it was actually quite funny, so it was good. <laughs> um, all right, so the, the waxing or the dripping of milk, I mean, everyone always likes to look for little waxicles on the end. So it's the colostrum deposits at the end of a teat. So it's a nice little picture of one there. Um, but be mindful because it can happen early. It can start as early as two weeks, uh, multiple weeks out from falling and they can wax for a couple of days and then stop and then start again. So generally speaking, um, it does, it is usually a pretty good indicator that you're getting closer, but don't be alarmed if, if your mare waxes up for a couple of days and then stops again and, and then starts again a week or so later, that's, it's not entirely uncommon. So, um, and then I have found as well, that's, you know, sometimes you'll get these mares that will actually just drip a tiny bit of milk and, and the more than actually, you don't necessarily see it, but this mare here, you can see her teeth are facing outwards and here's some little evidence on her legs that she's dripped a little bit of milk. Um, and she actually fold that night. So, um, so that can be a nice indicator as well. So have a little look at the legs, <clears throat> just see if they've dripped um, a little bit. Um, elongation of the vulva, this is a really nice one. And obviously I get to look at a lot of vulvas because we suture in the alarms. So yep. usually if I'm seeing this when I'm doing my rounds at night, checking all the mares and paddocks, they're coming straight in to get an alarm on because we're usually pretty close at this point as everything's getting nice and relaxed before the fall starts to come out. And then behavior changes. And I think if you can kind of sit down and watch your mares, um, or if maybe you've only got one or two, these are really nice things to look at. And it actually kind of just 
rolls into the next slide because a lot of these things are also kind of signs of first stage labor but I've noticed with a, a lot of my mares they tend to eat less that day that night they drink a lot they'll drink a lot more um, they have really small little piles and often quite a few piles of manure and they'll they'll be walking quite a lot so um, you might see them rolling a couple times the day before um, and um, often it's not it can go either way you can see them walking a lot or they just stand there and they're a bit like oh okay everything's moving um, so <laughs> you'll, you'll get to know your mares a little bit um, but definitely you'll start to notice a little bit of behavior changes as well so just lots and lots of monitoring 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 so keeping an eye on them so as I said that kind of rolls into the next one we'll talk about some when it all actually gets going so <clears throat> stage one labor is generally they're uncomfortable they're, they're everything's moving the, the foals on its way um, but it's so it's characterized by your mare just being uncomfortable she's restless she's getting up getting down she's just really uncomfortable um, stage one label labor can go on for a couple of hours actually so if you do notice your mare and you think gosh she's due this is really odd for her she just seems persistently colicky or uncomfortable keep monitoring her because you you may very well be in stage one labor and and you obviously want to be there for stage two so so don't go away or um, certainly this is a point where if your confidence level or skill set isn't super high and you've got your mare at home you might want to ring your vet and and get them alerted that your mare might be in stage one so that that way maybe they can you know either rearrange their day or or start heading in your direction to give you a hand if that's something that you wish um stage one technically ends when your when your waters break so um so going back to the alarms a little bit here so this is where the halter alarms actually can be quite nice because if your mare is getting up and down and quite uncomfortable you'll actually get alerted by the by those halter alarms at this point so you, you can generally potentially be there for stage one which is good right because so, you know, so how long does stage one go for though like, it, well it can go up for hours it can yeah. you know to, that's the thing so you could kind of be sitting there for like two hours which it's all very well if it's a lovely sunny day but it's not so great if it's one in the morning and basically snowing like here in Ballarat so um yeah so but that I think is one of the advantages of the halter monitors over the Volvo transmitter ones because these general discomfort okay. up and down, down tail swishing that won't activate your your Volvo transmitter so then we head into stage two which is basically your water breaking until uh the delivery of the actual fall um so this is the passing of the allantoic fluids um which generally you'll see the the well you might not see the, the fluids coming out because if you've got the volvo transmitters then this is when you'll start get activation so with the siglu system like we have this is when you get activation of that so we don't necessarily see the waters break or anything which is definitely potentially like a disadvantage that was stated at that repro conference because this is kind of when your timing wants to start and we'll talk a little bit about the 15 minute rule but you labor second stage labor generally with the mare should be should be pretty quick um, you would like things to be ticking along over the 15 to 30 minute stage um, so um, ticking along or are we going to get to that in a minute or yeah, yeah yeah so we'll, Sorry, we'll yeah. go through it so we've got our we've got our water breaking as I said hopefully it's all oh, there we go so there's um, another mare with our with our water breaking um, and then followed by this you'll, you'll see this little kind of white gray membrane starting to come out um, followed within that you should see a little foot so hopefully these are coming up all right and you can see there's a foot in this little white sack um, and then following that you want a second foot so here we've got one foot two foot and a nose so at this point um, well, it, and again, this will be a hundred percent depending on your skill set and, and your comfort levels with your falling. Mares fall in the wild all the time, and I do think that it's it's good to just, to let the mare roll along and, and let her do her thing. But if you are a little bit more intensive and you want to make sure that your confirmation or you're coming out in the right configuration, this is where you want to have a little look, make sure that the bottom of the feet. The foals little footsies are facing your mare's feet 
or the top of the coronary band is facing the top of the tail. Yeah. Um, so that way that tells you it's coming Superman way, which is the normal, um, you know, way that the foal should be coming. Um, and then often you'll find that the mirror will push quite um, consistently, quite regularly up until the foal's shoulder is coming out. And then it's not uncommon for her to sit and just have a little bit of a break. Once the shoulders are out, so don't, if, certainly if you're in that 15 minute to 30 minute time frame and the shoulders are out and she's having a bit of a break, don't, don't freak out at this point. She just is having a bit of a break because that was probably the, the, the toughest part. part. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so she's having a bit of a breather. Um, again, at this point, you're totally fine to, uh, you know, break the membranes over the foal and give the head a bit of a, um, uh, you know, a bit of a brush with your towels. Um, they'll often, you know, take their big breath and all the rest of it. If the, if the membranes haven't actually come off, come off themselves. So you can kind of, you, you, at this point I would be taking them off just you don't want the fold to suffocate or anything like that and then just walk away just let nature keep uh, yeah I mean I'm usually there um, just to you know, she's quite exhausted to be honest at this point I usually give her a bit of a hand because yep. the mares are quite exhausted and so we just give them a, a bit of a hand and then we kind of just let let them chill so you can see here I'm sitting oh, this is when I was quite pregnant um, <laughs> I was um, you know so this, this mare actually she was a maiden mare and she had a bit of a she had a bit of a tough pull so I gave her a bit of a help but you can see I'm just letting her everything just chill on its own so the foals back legs are still actually there because she's just having a break um, umbilical cord is still com intact and, and we don't disrupt those or anything just let the let the foal continue to get the mare's blood supply through that umbilical cord um, and, until they rupture it naturally essentially so it will rupture on its own especially when the mare tries to turn around and come get up and I think it's important just to leave that and let the foal keep getting a good blood supply while everything is um, kind of everyone's having a good rest and, and even, then even the back feet it's still in the yeah yeah well. I just yep yeah, just let them let them I think the um, picture earlier as well of the one I fall down the other day the fault that hind legs were still in there she'll it'll wriggle around a little bit and they'll they'll come out and um, yeah. or you can just you know if it's if it's in a big you know you want to move it a little bit you can just move them but leave it sitting behind its mum its mum knows that it's there um, so I think leave Back it to nature. yeah absolutely so leave it where it is you don't have to drag the foal and put it in front of its mom's nose or anything she knows it's there so just let it let it be there and um, and let her kind of do her thing she'll rest for a little bit but you'll be surprised they often will get up pretty quick and turn around and, and you know go straight to their foal so let everyone just rest um, like these two silly gooses here so. <laughs> um, now the one time that this all kind of changes a little bit is a red bag delivery so if you're seeing this red sack that's coming towards you instead of that lovely white sack that is up the top or that we just talked about before this is an emergency and this is where you want your vet on speed dial as you're running out to the paddock because obviously they're gonna have to get in their car and come out and give you a hand um, and then you want to be acting on this pretty quickly so it is a problem because it's um, it's it's the part of the placenta or the choreo alientoas that's actually out instead of the membranes that should be out and you've got um, an incomplete separation so the problem with this um, this partial or incomplete separation from the inner layer of the mare's um, lining of the uterus is that there is now going to be a lack of oxygen coming to the falls so there because of this separation you get very little or even no oxygen as the foal is being born which it would normally be having so they can end up with significant issues from hypoxia which is lack of oxygenation to the brain and all the rest of it they can even suffocate or, or asphyxiate so this is one of those things that you you really have to act quickly and, and not wait for the vet to come so this is where it comes into having that pair of scissors or a blade in your basic little box and sometimes you can get them with just your fingers as well but you're often quite stressed and everything so a pair of scissors is quite nice so you can just kind of make a stab and you just want to open up that red membrane as soon as possible and to knowing that you don't be don't be afraid or anything like that make a good cut and just get it wide open you should get a gush of fluid which is that normal water breaking that hasn't necessarily Sorry. happened and so you will get a gush of, of fluid and that's how you know that you've got it properly open 
And I think the big thing with these are that you really do need to deliver that foal as quickly as possible because it's, it's not getting the oxygen that it should be getting. So um, with these ones, you do want to get in there, see if you can kind of feel a front foot feel for another front foot and make sure you've got a nose coming. And if you're happy that you've got a, a nose and two feet, then and I personally pull that foal out and get it out as soon as possible. Um, and once it's out, you really want to be vigorously rubbing the foal's chest with a, you know, with your towels, getting that foal really stimulated so that it starts breathing as soon as possible. Um, you can also hang them upside down or over a gate, but uh, they're, you generally need two people to do that but yeah doing your best just to get this foal breathing as soon as possible because they they need that oxygen if you're on a bigger farm or you are a fairly experienced person with foaling maybe you have oxygen on 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 site um and so you want to get that oxygen up that foal's nose and, and get it on some some you know pure oxygen um, and as your foal, hopefully your vet's not far off because um, these foals will be monitored really closely for the next um, two to three days. It's not uncommon for them to do everything right, you know, immediately afterwards and be quite alert and look fairly normal. Um, but then you can unfortunately suffer the consequences of that whole lack of oxygen a little bit later on and even end up being a dummy foal like Cass spoke about last week. So really important with these that you try and try and be, be confident, be brave, and just get that foal out as soon as possible. Just quickly on the uh, rubbing with the towel, mm. is that just try and stimulate the breathing yeah, method so, of the lungs? Yeah, so often one of the things that's happening um, when a foal is exiting is that chest is being squeezed, and that's a big like, hey, wake up. Um, like the yep. magnesium squeeze. Um, and obviously when we're trying to get that fallout as quickly as possible, that isn't really happening super well. So really, really giving the chest a good, you know, rub dry, getting it kind of really stimulated and trying to get them breathing um, as quickly as possible. Yeah. Awesome. Um, again, this is, I think, really important um, to know or, and, and this will again will be depending on your comfort levels and how many you fold, but just, know when to call for help. So know when to call your vets. And um, obviously, like we just talked about, <laughs> call the vet for um, a red bag delivery. Um, and then I have this 15 minute rule with um, my nurses that help. So if your mare is straining, but you don't see any of those little white membranes within 15 minutes and the waters have broken, then you need to be calling. Uh, if you see the white membranes, but nothing else, then you need to be calling. If you see one foot, but then no other foot and no nose, then you might want to be calling. And then I put here, if you can see, or more likely if you can feel a tail, definitely be calling because that's not coming out, unfortunately. So these are usually some indications that you might have a malpresentation. So it's probably going to need a little bit more intervention and um, some veterinary help for that and for these. So uh, when you say uh, feel for a tail, <laughs> so more or less you say that it's, it, this... Some of these things are probably not for the person with one or more. No, probably not. But I think that's where it comes down to number one. So if you yep. if you know if your mare's down and she looks like she's straining and you're really not seeing anything in that 15 to 20 minutes, then then I'd be calling because you know for those of us that have fold lots down, we put our arm in there and feel straight away as to why. But um, that just if again, as I said, it depends on your comfort levels and how many you've done. Um, but if you're this is your first mare ever falling and it's at home, then I would just stick with number one. If, ring, if, the um, ring the vet if, if, if your mare is down and, and looks like she's pushing but nothing's coming, just stay with number one. Yep. Um, we'll just move on to third stage labor. So I just, I added in a, so I mean, that's the actual foaling situation. So you've got the foal on the ground now, but there's a couple other little things that I just thought we'd talk about because these are all things that we do in the first hour to two hours post falling and it's still really important to a uh, part of that whole falling process and that's your your placenta um, so obviously your third stage labor is the passing of the fetal membranes um, and the rule of thumb is three hours so we like them to be out within three hours so it means that often your mare will get up and because she obviously will get up and go straight to her fall and it means that the membranes are kind of hanging out like this so if you're going to do every, anything at all um, that, you know, you want to tie them up in a knot or something like that. So they're not dragging along the ground or the mare can't accidentally stand on them and pull them out or, you know, like traumatically pull them out. 
Um, in saying that, tying them in a knot is a lot harder than it seems. They're oh. slippery little suckers and it's not that easy. So I have that wrap on board um, and I've found that you just kind of try and put it in as much of a knot as possible and that wrap the bejesus out of it. it it's not as easy as it seems. <laughs> I'm, I'm certainly not the bravest around uh, the mares and the, and the following and, and the membrane. It's not my cup of tea by any stretch, but I've had to tie one in a, in a knot a couple of years ago and it's, uh, yeah, it's a hell of a yeah, job to try and do. It's nowhere near, they are very slippery little suckers and uh, yeah, so I use vet wrap and just vet wrap the bejesus out of it. Just, and it, it doesn't have to look pretty by all means, but it just, if it's not dangling or dragging along the ground so that she can't stand on it and accidentally traumatically pull them out. Um, and then by all means, definitely do not pull them out by all means, because there's still a lot of, um, vascular blood supply, um, attachments and, and I've had horrific, um, situations where by owners have accidentally unknowingly pulled them out thinking that was the thing to do. And the poor mares have bled to death fairly rapidly. So please don't pull them out by all means, just let the mare do her thing. Um, in saying that, um, if they are retained, it can be a, a, a pretty emergent situation for mares. Mares can get very sick very, very quickly with retained um, fetal membranes and, and they can end up toxemic with, um, you know, laminitis and all the rest of it very, very quickly. So if you are worried that your mare has retained her placenta or it's greater than the three hours, then I'd be contacting your veterinarian um, or, or stud master, wh wh whatever you've got on hand to start addressing these. And generally here, uh, certainly for me, I treat these mares pretty aggressively. They come in, they're on antibiotics and anti-endotoxemia, uterine flushes, ice boots, the whole lot. So we treat them pretty aggressively. Ice boots? Yeah, for the potential laminitic toxemia issues. So we try and stop. Stop it just yeah. in case it happens. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, if your placenta does come out, it's nice to have a little look at it. So try and lay it all out so it's nice and pretty. Um, and it looks like this one here has potentially got some placenta missing. So again, if you do that at home and you lay it out to look all pretty and you think some of it's missing, it might not be a bad idea to call your vet as well because it, it it's very likely that that is a uterine, or oh, sorry, a placental tag that's still retained. So even with a little tiny bit like that, your mare can end up quite sick. So um, my suggestion would be to contact your vet straight away and, and say, look, this is what I think is going on. Um, and at the very least, popping her on some antibiotics and probably some uterine flushes as well to try and get that tag out. I was going to say, because if you don't pick up that tag and they don't get sick and everything's fine, when you go to get them in file that later that year, or if you give them a year yeah. off, even worse, you can have a lot of issues. Because you can, yeah, yeah. You can end up with a lot of, um, you know, endometritis or even, you know, in, you know, uh, infections in there. It can, yeah. You can have low grade infections, so it can end up quite nasty. So addressing your third stage labor, I think is a really important thing as far as the whole process. Yes. <laughs> um, and I just popped a little slide in here about the new foal for everyone. I know this has probably been talked about in other slides. Definitely but... has not. Oh, it hasn't? Okay, no. okay, okay. <laughs> um, anyway, just because we're obviously your mare's just foaled, so you're still sitting there because you might still be in shock or, or you're just enjoying the whole process. But just from little notes that your foals will usually, they'll have their head up and they'll usually sit up within minutes and they'll be shaking their head. So this little guy, you can see he's still got his membranes on and everything and he's I don't know, his feet are probably still in there, maybe, yeah. I don't know. Definitely the umbilicus is still on there, but head is up, it's shaking his head, he's he's a happy little clam, you know? And, and it's funny, some of them will even start vocalizing and chatting yeah. straight away. It's They're really, really awesome little creatures. So um, they should have a suckle reflex within about 20 minutes. Um, they should, the rule of thumb is be standing um, within an hour and nursing within two. So those are the kind of the rule of thumbs. If you've got a foal that you know, maybe you fall down yourself, but uh, it hasn't been nursing in those kind of first two hours, again, I'd be discussing this with a vet and getting them on board because they really need to be nursing in those first couple of hours. To obtain the colostrum. Indeed, yeah. We'll talk about that now in the next slide. Um, oh, you would like them to pass their meconium, so that really hard um, black tar-like poop in the first 12 hours that can be kind of difficult to find um sometimes if you've got like especially if you've got a straw box or when you're in a paddock god yeah. um you know that can be hard to find so sometimes a good indicator is that 
you might see the really tan pasty fall poops and if you see those you know that your meconium's passed so because then you're on to the next type of poop so that's a good indicator as well and then obviously so if you don't see the black one don't panic if you see plenty of the tan one. if you see lots and lots of the tan one i i personally don't panic too much because it's probably past the meconium in order to get to the tan ones but certainly if you don't see anything and and you see a fold that looks like it's folds you can tell are straining like yeah. they hunch their little backs up their tails usually flag and they're really kind of almost like an angry child like they're just really upset about it so certainly if you see those things you'd, you'd be wanting to call your vet it's, and it might just need be something as simple as needing an enema mm. just to help that out and they love them <laughs> they do <laughs> they do um you'd like them to be urinating within the first 12 hours again this is obviously if you're great sit in the box with them that's wonderful but um we certainly just wander by and you can often hear them as well you can hear the little full urinations but um and i find that fillies usually wait for the 11th hour fillies usually end up urinating you know a lot later than than the colts um and if you don't see it but your foal is otherwise completely happy and normal it's not doing the hunched up back or tail flagging or colicky or anything like that don't don't panic um it probably has urinated it's just it's yeah, not one of those easy things for you to kind of see so but certainly something to be mindful of any e either which way is it um is there any scientific reason between be, behind why the uh fillies take a bit longer oh, i'm not sure i'm not sure just balance no, no, no yeah. reason yeah i mean we've got you know little colts are obviously a little bit more predisposed to having bladder ruptures but that's got nothing to do with their how long it takes to yeah. urinate that's maybe just one of those rules of thumbs that fillies Tend to take a bit longer but it's handy to know that yeah <laughs> um and then the other thing we do do is once the umbilicus is um ruptured and naturally we'll we'll clean it off so just clean the false little umbilical stump with a dilute we use dilute iodine but you can use a dilute chlorex chlorexidine as well and um, and we continue to do this daily for the next two to three days as well so just a couple little pointers because Obviously, you're going to be there with the fall, so these are all things to look at for the first couple of hours post falling. I'll just um, yeah. we'll say one thing just yeah. quickly while you're doing that. We've got a few questions. We will get to them at the end of it. Might yeah. be the best way. Uh, dot yeah. G and the like. So I will definitely get to the, all these questions. Um, we'll just get through this We've got and one more we, slide. So one more slide, and we'll be back. Sarah will be back on camera. She won't be able to fidget as much as what she is <laughs> while she's <laughs> sitting with the computer. Yes, I will. <laughs> um, and then so the last one i just wanted to talk about was colostrum and passive tra transfer i think maybe this has been so i'll just go over it really quickly um the, obviously it's the the passive transfer being the maternal antibodies really important for the foals within the first couple of hours of birth hence they really need to be up and drinking in the in that golden hour of two hours but they really they definitely need to be getting that colostrum in the eight to twelve so if you maybe you haven't seen your foal um your mare foal and you've arrived the next day and you're a little bit unsure did it get that colostrum or was it good quality colostrum and we'll talk about that in a sec um it's a good idea to give your um your vet a call and and we can check the specific gravity i'm sorry we can check your immunoglobulin status of your foal and, and intervene if need be so just a pointer is that good quality colostrum um, tends to be kind of yellow quite thick and sticky so you can milk a little bit of your mare's um, milk out after she's foaled to have a good look at it and see what's going on and then maybe if you're in the situation whereby you fall down quite a lot of foals and you want to take it to the next level we um, use these bricks refractometers um, which are brilliant um, and it will measure give you like a little reading like this and for us everything anything over 23 percent is considered good and we will give it give the colostrum to the foal if it is less than 23 percent so if that mare has a you know her her colostrum is less than 23 percent we will actually give the foal a banked colostrum um dose so we have a colostrum bank um that we try and replenish as we go through the season but we always have you know some in the freezer and then we'll defrost that and and give that to the foal so it again just because of the importance of having that early colostrum i like to be just know peace of mind for me that it's had it so um on top of that as well i will add if you want to if you are falling down a couple and you want to have some colostrum in your freezer 
you can, if your mare and you've measured it and your mare has got good colostrum, you can milk 20, 200, 250 mils off her, off one side, and you can go ahead and filter that through either some cheesecloth at home or some gauze swabs and pop it in the freezer, um, document the date and everything. Um, and what percentage her colostrum was and then that's your little colostrum bank ready for you um, sure. and and taking that 200 250 mils off the mare it's still she's still got sufficient amounts for the for her foal to still get good colostrum um, dose off that as well so, so how many days out would you do that like I, we, I do this right after they fall Right, yeah, so that's why we do this so so that, that way it's getting that colostrum within two hours so just quickly back to the um, the measuring, the, mm -hmm. the bricks me measuring. Are they inexpensive? Like a no, 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 not at all. I um, mini sheep has them. Um, I don't want to get in trouble here. No, but no, no, I no, think, I think I think they're less. Price, than we won't put a price on it, but they're not no, expensive. No, very it? inexpensive. So if you have two or three mares, it, it seems a no-brainer to have one. Totally, it's yeah. very minimally, um, and it's really minimally invasive. You just have to literally um, get a little bit of the mare's milk, and then use a little dropper here to pop it on the screen and then you have a look under the light. It's super easy, very quick, and something that you can re be really efficient about checking that your foal is gonna get good quality colostrum. Awesome. And then you can intervene really quickly if it hasn't, because by having a, if you have some banked colostrum, then you can intervene nice and fast. We're always looking for sp sponsors too, mini tube, just in case you're watching <laughs> this, you should be uh, possibly involved in, uh, yeah. in the show. Yeah, um, so yeah, I think the, you know, that's, basically the fur the falling process and then the first kind of two to three hours post falling and um so in in a very very quick little seminar um but in summary i just want to say to everyone just be ready the season is upon us um so be as prepared as you possibly can um and know that you can be as prepared as you think you are and things can still go wrong so i think just being as prepared as possible um, always monitor your mare as I said looking for changes is, is possibly one of the most valuable things um, especially if you do know your mares um, have a basic foaling kit and, and as we said whatever your levels are just have some things some really basic stuff ready um, including your vet's phone number on speed dial <laughs> or, or someone that can come and help you um, know the little hints of when to intervene so once labour starts so even if you just take home two or three points and say that's my comfort level is if I don't see membranes in 15 minutes that's your thing to know and just know that right 15 minute rule I'm going to call now so knowing when to intervene yep. um, keep the 30 minute thing is in in your head as well in case you know things are cruising along and then all of a sudden you don't have a fall you know that's another time to comes back to the intervening um, if you're lucky enough to get a lovely little foal out, you know, don't rupture the umbilicus, just let everything do its own thing and definitely don't pull your, your mare's um, membranes out at all. Um, if you don't feel confident tying them up or you don't want to touch them because they're a bit gross, just leave them. But um, yeah, just do, yeah, I mean, just don't, don't pull them at all. Um, and then just let your mare and foal do their thing. Let them bond. Ensure you, your foal does have good colostrum though. Um, and then monitoring. Monitoring, we, we look at all our mares and foals two to three times a day, um, full physical exams for the first three days because, and then they can go out and be a little kiddos. And it's one of the things, it's, it's a crazy, that's the end of your slots? Yes. I'll um, put you back on camera so then you, yeah. and now she wants to have a drink. Yeah, sorry, sorry. About, sorry about that. But um, it is one of the things, that it's your investment and you, this, time that we're talking about is the most crucial part of your investment whether it's a thousand dollar service fee or a thirty five thousand dollar service fee you've still put everything you want to get this process and yeah. this is the most important process isn't it yeah well and i think that's partly why it's quite stressful as well because everything leading up to this it's been you know nearly 11 months or whatever and it's just like okay it's just chilling out and then this all happens this all can all happen this whole slide can this whole seminar can be within two hours you know what i mean like including I mean, we can generally have a foal out, colostrum checked, administered to the foal within an hour, two hours, yeah. and then back to bed. So, back to bed? Yeah. <laughs> but I'm sure you go back to bed a little bit sleep, uh, a bit easier than perhaps uh, the likes of Dot G and the likes that I've got here for a question. So Dot, yep. we'll start off with Dot. Uh, what percent, what, um, what is the percentage of mares that would probably need some kind of intervention? Is it rare or quite common for mares to have difficulty 
experience differently? Oh gosh, I mean, oh god, that's a pretty good question. There is uh, I'm, red bag procedures, which obviously you know are can be up to five to ten percent of fallings actually. Um, it's a documented percentage if you need percentages. So, but I don't want that to freak anyone out because I mean we've had. Oh my gosh, touch wood. You know, we, we touch wood haven't had a lot of complications here. Um, so percentage wise, I, I, I don't know as far as mares needing help. Most mares, I think, will, will be fine on their own in, in my experiences. Um, but if you do want a percentage wise, certainly red bags, which would be the main emergency that most people are faced with, can be up to five to 10% of fallings. So. Wow, that yeah. much. Yeah, yeah, it's quite high, in, in which I was quite surprised about as well, considering yeah. touch wood, we haven't had any here. Uh, Murphy Murphy says no time or need for questions, so that's good, but she actually likes to show that she's a regular. Uh, <laughs> Doc G's given us another wrap. Uh, Maggie Smith, apologies, don't ever apologize, Maggie. Any question is a good question. This may have been um, in a question earlier to ask, uh, to ask one of the earlier episodes, but at what age is a mare probably a bit old to have her first foal and or and do older mares have more, uh, sorry, do older mares have more, more, of, a, more of a risk of complications? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's definitely, certainly for mares that are coming to fall down here with me, anything over 15 years kind of gets a little red flag next to it. Um, and there's a couple things that come into that, um, especially mares that are a little bit older, so 15 years plus that have had multiple falls. Um, because obviously your foal growing inside, it depletes quite a bit of the calcium. It depletes a lot of things off the mares, but one of the things is it can deplete her calcium stores and, and make her a little bit more at risk of catastrophic bone fractures because their bone stock will reduce a little bit and obviously they have to lie down and get up to foal. Um, also post falling risks such as having um, a bleed which anyone that follows thoroughbred breeding will know that that's recently happened to a very lovely mare yep. um, and so these things definitely we can see more frequently in older mares that have had more and more falls so yes i think that as your mare gets older and has multiple falls there are increased risks what's too old um <clears throat> i think that depends a little bit on the mare as well like you can have some mares that are 13, 14, 15 years old, and they're, they, they're old mares for their age. Um, and then you can, I've got a couple mares that are 21, 22 falling down, and they look amazing for yep. 21, 22. Um, certainly here with Pat, uh, once they hit 20, I say no more, and we flush embryos off them to be safe. Um, but it's entirely up to you and the health of your mare. Um, I, certainly if she hasn't had a lot of mares, um, a lot of falls, I'm sorry, and she's a bit older, she's probably a uh, lower risk than a mare that is older and has had lots of falls. Yeah. Hopefully that helps, sorry. Yeah, it sounded, uh, yeah, me going backwards and forwards in my head too. That's <laughs> not saying too much at all. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Nellie Melba, who won the uh, Baristock prize today, do you do you, 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 uterine flushing as a matter of course after falling? Yes, I do. I, I hate people that throw in tricky words. So no. you'll, you'll do that routinely? Routinely for the first three days. We flush them every day for three days, but that's because a lot of my mares are going back straight back and fall. Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah, yes, I do. I flush them all afterwards, starting the next day. So I'm a bit confused. Murphy, Murphy's put another question in here, but um, I'm not sure exactly what it's for. It just says, and therefore the fall. Um, might have been something that we were saying at the time, so I might have missed that one um, okay. there. Um, Harness Breeders Victoria, Mini Tuber, terrific supporters of Harness Breeders Victoria. So, yeah, there are responses. So, this is my way of getting a kick up the bum from Desiree. Um, the annual two year old filly of the year trophies. Uh, make sure your membership is in to keep up to date uh, and have your fillies eligible. So, well done, Desiree, for correcting me on that one. Uh, Steve Johnson, really awesome presentation. He also liked a lot of the stuff that was with the um, for the maiden mares. Um, he enjoyed that part. Uh, I want my mares to fall down at the vet. How long before the due date should they go? Uh, yeah, so the general recommendation is two to three weeks pre-estimated falling date. Um, I think discuss with your vet as well because everyone's a little bit different what they would like because as I was saying, what it can depend on is the situation that your mare is going into when she gets there. So if she's going into a herd with a bunch of other mares that are also coming into foal then you might want her there earlier so that she can settle and get settled 
if she's going there to just be in her own little environment, she might not have to go, you know, really, really early. And then I think as well, it depends on how far you have to travel. So I had some clients that come to like three or four hours away. They tend to come up earlier. So two to three weeks pre estimated falling date because it's a long distance to travel. So maybe a little bit more stressful on the mare. For my clients that are coming, you know, 15 minutes up the road, they might wait until a lot closer to their falling date. This is going to sound like a silly question, so I'll ask it. No silly um, question. I tell everyone else there's no silly mm. question. Stressful mare, like if you put a mare on a foal and they start pouring and carrying the ground and you're only going to go around the corner, is that more stressful on a foal as compared to a long float ride? Like which way, when you said about um, getting them here earlier, if they've got a stressful... So if they, if they go on a float, go to sleep, and you don't feel them moving, you don't necessarily have to worry about a stressful float ride? Yeah, but, probably not. Yeah, yeah, if they're quite chill and happy it's not a problem but yeah if you know that your mare's a really bad traveler and she's not happy corner. you might want to go earlier just so that you know you're not stressed you're not having to do it in an emergency situation um and um and you know she can just settle and, and have plenty of time to settle i think that's one of the things i'm learning a little bit or a lot from from this that people like yourself like kath um and and you know alabar a lot of our sponsors the ones that do it regularly their stress levels aren't as high as potentially people that do, you know, two, three meals oh, or even five, enough, five, though. six minutes. Yeah, that's but, right. But and that's, that's fair enough. Yeah. That might be one of the factors that people have got to factor in for their own lifestyle totally. as much. If I've got clients that they fall down one or two, they do it every single year, but they want it here early because they don't want that stress. They're really, they just say, nope, you deal with that. Okay? Yeah. It's and, fine. And Let us deal with it. Um, Jenny Lewis has written here, wonderful presentation. Um, Jenny actually won the Barristock uh, Prize two weeks ago, and she didn't tune in last week, but she had an excuse because she was at Kilmore um, Harness, Harness Racing, racing. so, so yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll definitely let her off. Uh, Jared Maloney, very comprehensive information, uh, not freaking out yet, <laughs> says Dot G, so that's a, that's a good thing. Uh, Kenny Adams, Steve Johnson, how close, uh, how close to falling do you worm? I, I worm them two weeks. So two weeks, usually 10 to, 10 to 14 days pre-estimated falling date. Yep. Yeah. So um, it's, the worming had a myth a few years ago. It's starting to be expelled, isn't it? Like people were always scared about worming their horses, but if your horses are regularly wormed, it's... You should it's, be fine. Yeah. yeah. It's just um, you will get some passive transfer through that passive transfer to the foal to help with the um, strong goals for the young foals. Yep. So, yeah. Yep. Very good. Um... Hang on, there are more questions coming here. So it was on. Uh, what if you can't? Yeah, Murphy Murphy. I thought Murphy Murphy couldn't uh, hang around for the questions, but I think I've misinterpreted one of her questions. So I apologise okay. for that. She's also a Barra Stock winner as well, don't worry. Okay. Uh, what if you can't get near your mare? That's <laughs> a great question because <laughs> oh. it can happen. <laughs> oh, it, no, it definitely happens. We've got a couple. Um, yeah, it's a nightmare. It's a total nightmare. I don't know that I can give you any veterinary advice as far as that goes. Um, I've got one in right now. That post fall wing, she's really, really fall proud. And she, she's getting better now. She's two days out, and so she's a little bit better. But we managed to catch her with the two of us. Here's a couple little pointers, just as there's no scientific thing behind this. Um, be very careful is the other thing, number one. But um, if you can catch the fall um, and keep the fall between you and the mom, she generally, she won't kick the fall. So what I will do is I'll grab the fall and then ruddle up to the mare like this with the whole holding the foal and then grab the mare so um i'm not recommending to do this but <laughs> that's what i do so if you're wanting my advice but um they can be a total nightmare um i've got as i said i've got one in right now she she has a catch lead on so that going forward safety wise um she's got a long lead on it means that we can use a catch pole to get the lead and then as soon as we've got the lead she's fine but um yeah they can be a total nightmare um and usually what I'll do, as I said with those, is I catch the foal and I rugby tackle the foal up to the mum and then I catch mum and I leave a catch lead on her. One little thing, I, because I'm a horse dancer, I go around a lot of places and um, you see a lot of uh, red um, cow ear tags hanging off Dangerous. head stalls or off yep. chains and it's a, it's a good warning. So yep. if you do have one of those mares um yeah we'll, and, and we will write on the tags in. yeah yeah take care yeah because when you yeah. see red it, it may not be that it might be they're dangerous in a crush or whatever mm -hmm. but at least if you see that tag you, you're automatically yeah. on your toes that something might be going to happen yeah so. yeah and sometimes you don't know until they fall sometimes it's right after they fall so do, do they 
do they come out of that? Like, is it or is it? Uh, I think it's an individual. It just depends. Um, I what did I last year? I think I had three that were very fall proud, and all three of them. It was mostly just for the first kind of three to four days, and then after that, they're pretty like okay, it's fine. Um, but I have had other mares as well that the whole time they, they have to be on their own because they're fall, really fall proud towards other mares. So um, again, these are mares that if you unfortunately figure it out the hard way that they are like that, then like you said, you want to document it somehow. So whether it's documented in her records and we have a big whiteboard here. So all the information, even if it's just a red cross next to her name. Um, at least it alerts whoever's there to say like, okay, that's not normal. Something else is going on. Um, and those mares just might have to be separated from other mares. And they'll ask, they'll ask the, um, question, um, how long can you keep colostrum, um, for and, and, and to be safe to use. So that's from so fro Maggie Smith. So frozen. Yes. I presume so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it can, it can be in your freezer for a couple of years, as long as it stays well frozen that whole time. Yeah. Very and good. so when you defrost it as well, just I should probably mention it needs to be at room temperature. You can't just chuck it in the microwave because you'll um, rupture all the... That's huge. Happy... Yeah, 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 yeah. That's really... Sorry, I should have said that. Yeah, so you can put it in um, warm water is what I'll do, but the, the water is just lukewarm and it just has to um, defrost over time. So you can't just pop it in the microwave, unfortunately, and have it ready to go in a minute or so. No, that, that's pretty important though, I mm. think. Um, yeah, and the fact that you can let it do it in the water. Uh, yeah, so just, just warm water, so certainly not boiling water or anything like that. Very good. Nellie Melbourne, a great presentation, um, and she also thanked Barristock, which is great. Um, Sharon Ralph, uh, great job, Sarah, loving your presentation. I think that's Sarah, Sharon Ralph from yeah. Arak Trotting Club. It the, is, yep. one, yes. Any time you want to bake some cakes for a Sharon on a Sunday, that'd I be agree, lovely. Sharon. I'm yeah. missing your cakes yeah. this year. COVID 19 is no good. Uh, <laughs> Steve Johnson says, Pray and wear padding. <laughs> He's obviously going back to catching catching the horse. Oh, uh, no. Pray and wear, wear padding, padding. But we've had plenty of people interact. And, and this what the whole idea of these shows are for is to get people interactive and aware of, of breeding and, um, and getting involved. And, Become a member of Harness Breeders Victoria dot or Vic. I, I'll get in trouble. I've already been in trouble for one one thing that I got wrong. Vic, I've got to try, sweep it over as well. I'm getting in trouble for everything. <laughs> Vic Harness Breeders dot org dot au. Follow the links to whatever you would like there. Um, actually, I had a couple of little questions. Um, when you group your mares, mm -hmm. you try and group them. Is there a, is there a day limit? Like so so. You, do you try and group them as close, like within 20 days, within 10 days or? No, so generally, so when I do it all when we're weaning, because everything's usually a little bit hectic at weaning time anyway, the mares are all kind of stressed anyway, so you may as well change their paddocks around if need be. But, um, and also as I'm going, like as I'm breeding them. So if I can get, um, for example, um, say in that week, I have inseminated six, eight mares in that week all eight will go out together because then they'll all be 14 16 day scans in the same week and then 30 days if and heaven forbid they're all positive then that's great that's their falling paddock yeah because that's the first eight all in a row um and we just have paddocks of six to eight because that's what my paddocks hold size wise yeah yeah size wise so if your paddocks are three mare paddocks and just keep them in groups of three or if your paddocks are 20 that's awesome you can chuck them all out but um as they're getting closer then you can kind of pick like three or four out of that herd of six to eight and bring them up nice and close and then they go into the just, singles just on your paddock theory i like i like learning things mm. and i'll just drop my pen um how do you decipher a six horse paddock or a six mare paddock to a three is there a rule of thumb for you or is it just good size, size. yeah good size yeah just depending as... yeah so the the paddocks out here behind my falling paddocks are are quite a bit smaller than my big big mare paddocks um, out the kind of lane out the laneways um, so we, I only like to put three or four in there at a time just because yep. they are smaller than the ones that they've been out for in the whole winter um, and then yeah as I said they come into the single paddocks on their own um, and the other one was with you or saying with the bellies um, and they've had a few foals and their belly naturally drops there was a theory well it wasn't a theory there's, there's been a little bit of talk about um, exercising mare so if a mare's missed a year or two or hasn't been in foal 
getting them exercise to tighten that up. Do you subscribe to that at all? Or? Oh, I don't. I mean, I don't, but it's, I don't think it's a bad thing by all no. means. I, um, it's probably more of a time thing with me. Like my mares are just outside all the time wandering around. So that's unfortunately their exercise. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't think you'd be wrong to do it. Um, but as far as I wouldn't be putting extra work into going out and exercising it every day for 15 minutes or anything like that. Uh, Murphing, Murphing definitely didn't have uh, too much time, or was not enough time. An old horseman I know said, colts always take longer, longer gestation. I can't believe it's true, you've just not. No, there is a rule of thumb, yeah. There but is a discussion It's always been that. the case so far. Yeah, so there is, it's interesting, I was listening to a repo conference in the States a little while ago, and um, one of the first things they said was things that can affect gestation length, which um, can be a horrible winter. Um, they listed off all of these things, a horrible winter, poor pasture, poor feeding, and then colts. So colts can generally have a longer, slightly longer gestation length. So they need a little bit longer to cook. That's because we're smarter, come out bigger, <laughs> stronger. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> let me keep going. Okay. Yeah. Do you find it's harder to get an older man back in foal again? Yeah. And is, is it a better chance with fresh semen or frozen? Fresh semen for sure, like regardless. Um, there's been papers that have put out, been put out that have showed that horses over the age of 14, they're just, um, their conception rates, especially to frozen, will drop quite astronomically, actually. Um, over the age of 14, I think, and by the time they get up to 16 years old, it can be even down to 20% 20, 20 with frozen semen. So, yeah, that's chilled nice. semen for sure for older mares. Um, or, you know, if you want to give it a go, just be realistic about what your potential conception rates are. Um, Steve Johnson, uh, Mick Blackmore's tuned in too. That's just a little side one for me. That's okay. Um, do you rebreed on foal heat or normal 18 days? N never 18 days. So I foal think, heat. No, so fo yeah, that's right. So yeah. So generally the rule of, because, well, here at the farm, uh, a very high percentage of my mares go to frozen semen. So anywhere between 75 and 80% will go to frozen semen. So we never go to fall heat on frozen semen. So in those cases, we'll allow them to have their first cycle um, and then potentially short cycle them to bring them back in um, or just monitor them and go on their second cycle. And with ch if a mare is going back to chilled semen, I'm more than happy to, to go on their fall heat if they have cleaned up nicely after falling. So nice. yeah, so we'll flush all of the mares post falling anyway, but you'll still find regardless of if you flush them and treat them and um, that some of them will just pull a little bit of um, fluid still, or they might have some inflammation um, going on. Um, and those ones are probably not the best candidates to go on fall heat with. Um, but if they've cleaned up really nicely, their cervix has tightened down, everything's feeling really good in there, then I'm more than happy to go with chilled semen on um, fall heat. Um, Sarah, when, uh, when do you take the mare um, into the sing single packs away from the herd or a friend's? So when do you do that? Just basically at the last minute? So or? once they're in that group of little three or four, we're looking at them twice a day. So morning and night, we do a little walk through the paddock. So it kind of can go either way. So if they're a maiden mare, I'll bring them out probably 10 to a week to 10 days before their estimated due date, just to be careful. Um, especially mid season when we're nice and warm springs there, you might maybe even bring them in two weeks earlier and um, into the, if they're an older mare and they've had a couple falls and I really kind of just go on their sign. So usually once they start to bag up, then we'll bring them on their own. And it's all my falling paddocks are like, they're all right next to each other and right in front of the group paddocks. So they're not on their own and like away from everyone they still get to see everyone so they're usually pretty happy to be honest so usually don't mind too much probably something if you are planning and it's definitely not what this webinar is about but planning to um or setting up a property to make sure you you do forward plan that you can mm. put those paddocks in the right spot so that yep. you can still have that herd mentality but yeah. on their own so yeah yeah so they can like literally look over the back fence and they're still three or four mares behind them they have mares on either side of them so usually they're pretty happy yeah very good. 
Uh, huge thanks to all those who made these episodes possible. Uh, been really enjoyable this session. This session is actually being brought to you by Asbar. So we're getting there, Sarah. Uh, you said you wouldn't uh, talk for longer than an hour. We've been going an hour and a half. Oh, wow. Nick, Nick Hooper will be very, very impressed with this. Thank you, Warren. Holy. So, yeah, so we've got to do a couple. Of, please, if you've got any questions, you'll have to be quick. But we have a, a draw um, for a $250. Uh, breeders bonus donated by Asba. So cool. as I said, get onto their Facebook page um, and you can go from there. Now, you, you're to draw this out, but okay. I'm under strict instructions. It's got to stay in Victoria. It doesn't have to, but okay. apparently Ooh. I keep getting New South Wales cool. people and Tassie people, which is great this for is heavy people. This is more stressful than following. It is. Don't mm. worry, you've got to try and read it. And this is Desiree's sign of a joke to oh. me too. So Have I got two? Yep. Yeah, it's split in half. Cameron Lewis, Tatura East. That's good, yeah. Is that Victoria? It's, yes. See, I yes. don't know. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very, very good. Could be anywhere um, I go, like, okay. I'm sure Nick Hooper will be very, very impressed uh, with, with that. So, yeah, so we're fine. Uh, yeah, so well done to uh, to Cameron Lewis. So you, he's won that. Just very, very quickly, I forgot to uh, say it there before. Don't forget the bun. Yeah, we've got a bonus episode going to be on uh, September the 6th for the uh, changing landscape of Vic breeders um, and what is what is actually happening um, in that field um, going forward and next week's no that's the wrong one I don't want that doesn't matter I'll go back to the home street next week we'll be with uh, Dr. Kath McIntosh so we'll be fine there as well um, and yes, see so the fact that you've got a Victoria one, Desiree's even happy with that as oh, well. Great. So she's very, 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 very happy a, a, as well to, to get that. Sarah, thank you uh, very much. Um, we've had a few people, more people saying well done, so which is good. Mm -hmm. I uh, must say thank you very much. Well done to the hospitality. Well done to everything that's going on here too with Rasta Trotter or Yabby Dam, yeah, whichever way, way it goes. I think everything that Pat's doing. And it's exciting. Don't forget, actually, I should have uh, mentioned it too, is go to the uh, website on Harasta Trotter mm. to visit for the uh, chance to win a service fee to uh, Bald, Bald Eagle. Eagle. And what's the other horse? Um, forget, yeah, sorry, shouldn't throw you under the bus like that. No. Go there, Louise will kick both our bums for yeah. not remember, but yeah. it'll be fine. But yeah, there's a chance of winning a service now. fee. Great competition, so get involved. Uh, Stay in tenders are coming out too, a little side note that I'm doing so. Um, that's okay. They're all good compliments. Uh, compliments. Thank you, Dot. We'll appreciate that. Uh, stand and tenders bought. I've got an all trotting stand and tender, so which Pat would like that. Mm -hmm. And also Swan Hill. I've got a stand and tender out now, so keep your eye on that for breeding. This has been um, episode nine of. Um, uh, sorry, uh, a breed to succeed. I forgot the name. <laughs> Where am I going? Uh, thank you, everyone that's uh, given us input and uh, information as well. And thank you very much for all the kind words back. Um, don't forget to contact Sarah too if you uh, have any questions. Come and uh, get in touch with us. She is a practicing vet as well. But um, it's been um, the show for this week. We'll be back next week with Kath McIntosh. I think I'll be on farm with Kath as well, maybe not a Zoom. Um, and then, as I said, the extra one. Make sure you tune in for that on September 6th at 4 o'clock. Thank you very much to everyone who's taken part.